Good afternoon, or good morning, pardon me. I've already made a mistake. Good morning, everyone. I'm joined today uh, and honored uh, to be with the woman on my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, another familiar face, the state's epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tan. Thank you both for being here. To my far left, another guy who needs no introduction, the Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. And today, to my immediate left, we have the honor to be joined by our state's treasurer, Liz Moyo. We'll get to Liz in a minute, but it's an honor to have you here. And uh, I want to thank Jared Maples for being here and uh, from the Director of the Office of uh, Homeland Security and Preparedness and other teammates. Before we get to Liz, um, a, we have an announcement. Throughout the past week, we've taken the first few steps on our road back, opening up avenues for our residents to begin to once again enjoy all our state has to offer and to begin the restart and recovery of our economy. And today we're taking another step. I am signing yet another executive order, lifting the limit on outdoor gatherings from 10 persons to 25 individuals. Indoor gatherings remain limited to 10 people. Additionally, this order allows for recreational campgrounds, both public and private, to reopen effective immediately. In both outdoor gatherings and campgrounds, however, social distancing must be adhered to. Organized gatherings, for example, must include clear demarcations for attendees, and we strongly recommend that everyone continue wearing face coverings. So if you were looking forward to gathering with your neighbors for Memorial Day cookout, you may do so, so long as social distancing and personal responsibility remain the order of the day. With this, the capacity for charter and fishing boats, outdoor batting cages and driving ranges, among other re outdoor recreational businesses, will similarly be increased to 25. We are able to confidently make this decision today because of the hard work that each and every one of you have put in through social distancing to relieve the stresses on our health care system. Because you have taken to heart all that we have asked you to do and the faith you have put in us to make the right decisions to safeguard public health, we could take this step together. The metrics from our hospitals that we need to click into place, continue to do so, as you can see. Hospitalizations and the numbers of patients in our ICUs and on ventilators, the key indicators we need to see fall, have all fallen dramatically. The progression across the past two weeks, again, green balls are good, red balls are not, has been constant. Each green light means a day that the numbers we need to see decrease, actually decreased, and even when we did have a red light day, it was often followed by an even bigger green light day. Bless you. Uh, and we're seeing this reality across each region of our state. Make no mistake, you all did this. New hospitalizations is something that Judy and Tina and I look, uh, continue to scrutinize quite closely. Each day brings with it more signs that we are moving closer to being able to enter phase two of our restart. But make no mistake, we will continue down this road responsibly and deliberately because we still lead in some indicators, as you can see, in which we would rather not. However, I am proud that we're able to take this step today and to add a little bit more hope and optimism to the unofficial start of summer. Before you ask me, uh, two quick caveats. This does not include outdoor dining. We hope to get to outdoor dining sooner than later. And it does not yet include guidance on graduations. I'm hopeful that early week we can offer guidance on outdoor graduations. Now, moving on, as I mentioned, we are joined today and have the honor to have to my left State Treasurer, Liz Moyo. Uh, Liz and her team recently released their first look into the tremendous impact this emergency is having on our state revenues. And today they are following that with a more comprehensive report, which they are providing to the legislature. We just came from back to back, very constructive meetings, uh, first with the Senate President and Speaker, uh, Steve Sweeney and Craig Coughlin and, and their, their senior folks, and then immediately thereafter with the minority leaders, Senator Tom Kane and Assemblyman John Bramnick and their leaders. And again, those were very good, constructive, uh, frank meetings. It is a stark report, and it lays out the fiscal crisis that looms right around the corner from our public health crisis. I won't steal any of Liz's thunder, and I know she has a short overview to share with us here, and she will conduct a virtual follow-up session with the media this afternoon to dive into the numbers in greater detail. Am I right in saying it's 
1.30 this afternoon. Uh, so you'll forgive us for not getting uh, too deep on the details uh, at this particular gathering, but Liz will do that uh, within the next couple of hours. I have been clear since March that we are facing an unprecedented public health crisis that would soon be followed by a similarly unprecedented fiscal crisis. When Liz makes her announcement later today, the full scope of COVID-19's fiscal impact will come into view. Suffice it to say, the hard choices I predicted are now at our doorstep. Since March, I have also made clear that to bridge this fiscal gap, we desperately need more federal financial assistance. We have not yet received that. Uh, we've had some, but not nearly uh, what we're going to need. I had similarly asked the legislature to authorize state borrowing to ensure that we can fund crucial government operations, and I'm grateful, especially for Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin's support for this proposal and for posting it for a vote on June 4th, but we still do not have this authority, and therefore we cannot rely on these funds. So the numbers you hear today do not include any aspiration, which we hope is sooner than later for borrowing proceeds or for any federal cash assistance beyond the CARES Act. As I had forecast, today we're forced to begin making some hard decisions. We are doing our best to preserve our most critical investments where we can. For example, we are proposing a $10 million investment in the Department of Health, especially and specifically uh, for our long-term care facilities. As we work toward our new September 30 deadline for enacting a fiscal year 2021 budget, the challenge we face in balancing our wants and needs is going to be enormous. The revenue losses we can already project stemming from our current emergency are drastic. A projected $10 billion over the next slightly more than calendar year through June 30 of 2021. And without a series of deliberate and responsible measures in place, much of what we're going to depend upon to lift us up off the mat simply won't be there for us. We won't be able to support our small businesses. We won't be able to help families get back to par. And all the work that we have done to put our fiscal house back in order with back-to-back -back record surpluses, the savings we've gleaned in health care, the deposits into our rainy day fund, all of that will be swamped. Certainly, there are things that can help us mitigate some of this crisis. First, we need Washington to step up with significant direct fiscal assistance for states. Every day, it seems this becomes a more and more bipartisan endeavor. And that's because more and more people in both parties, by the way, are seeing what this support means. But there are also just as many minds that remain closed and intractable. And one of those closed minds controls the Senate agenda. But let's be clear about what we're asking for. Some of the closed mind folks call this a bailout. I'm not sure what they mean other than they're trying to use charged words for partisan gain. Here's what this aid actually really does mean. It means being able to pay our police, fire, EMS first responders. It means being able to keep our healthcare workers on the job for our recovery. It means being able to ensure that our kids have the educators they will need come fall. It means the trash being picked up. It means having the army of workers at the Department of Labor culling the backlog of claims. I remain ever hopeful that this package will get to the president's desk and be signed. And I will continue to push this case with the president and his team and Speaker Pelosi, Senate Minority Leader Schumer, and with our entire delegation. But success is far from guaranteed, so we must prepare in other ways. And I should say that I'm going to spend about two hours this afternoon uh, dialing into Washington uh, and other governors, both sides of the aisle, uh, to, to, to make the case and to go through exactly the sort of budget impact that we're announcing today. Now, as I said, we have to prepare in other ways. And in that, I thank again Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin for his leadership in posting for a vote legislation that would allow us as a state to take advantage of record low interest rates to get the funding we will need to preserve and protect our vital economic growth and social programs and a whole lot of frontline jobs. As I've said many times before, we've been approaching a fiscal cliff but today we get our first glimpses over its edge, and it isn't pretty. And we have two choices. We can toss our state into that abyss, or we can take measures that will allow us to slowly back away from that edge and keep our feet on solid ground. 
I certainly know the outcome I prefer, and I suspect overwhelmingly you prefer, and I hope that the legislature and our leaders in Washington will join us. We had a good conversation on this uh, this morning with the Senate President and Speaker, uh, and time is of the essence. That said, let me shift gears and turn to the overnight numbers. Yesterday, we received an additional 1,394 positive test results. You can see the current statewide total of 152,719. Here is the trend line of those cases. And then I'm also happy to say the daily positivity or spot positivity rate for t test samples for May 18, which was for Monday, was 14%. And I think Judy and I, I'm going to go out on a limb. I don't know. I, I hope Christina will join us here. That There's no weekend distortion with that number. And Judy will go through what that looks like on a regional basis. And we can see from the map that we look at, daily uh, remains largely unchanged and going in the right direction. Looking at our long-term care facilities, the trend rate of new cases continues downward, and with the additional help from the Federal Department of Veterans Affairs, we announced yesterday we have faith they'll continue to decline. You can see 29,262 positive cases across our many hundreds of long-term care facilities, and we can see as well the numbers of lab-confirmed fatalities associated with our long-term care facilities is decreasing, but look at that 4,666 blessed souls and lives lost. And again, as I've said many times, uh, as in the here and now 24-7, uh, we have uh, every, thrown everything, uh, including the kitchen sink, uh, at saving as many of the several hundred thousands of lives still associated with long-term care facilities, including both residents and members of staff. In our hospitals, the number of patients currently being treated for COVID-19 is 3,049. Our field medical stations report 43 patients. This is a breakdown of hospitalizations across regions. The number of patients reported in either critical or, or intensive care is now 846. Ventilator use sits at 674. That's, by the way, nearly half of what it was just two weeks ago. There were 151 new COVID-19 hospitalizations yesterday, while another 259 live Res, uh, patients left our hospitals. And here are those numbers charted across our regions, which we look at every day. As I said at the top, every trend we need to see to move along our road back, we are seeing. Every key indicator is down from the peak, and the bad days are just as often followed by an equal, if not better, good day. And so we, as we enter this weekend, yes, please enjoy it, but don't get complacent. Keep up with your social distancing and wear a face covering, please, if you're going out, especially if you're somewhere where social distances are hard to keep. Let's have a great weekend and let's prove that we can keep these trend lines moving in the right directions. However, as we enter Memorial Day weekend, we must remember those who have, we have lost throughout this crisis and we need to add to their numbers another 146 blessed lives lost of our New Jersey family, our statewide total stands at an almost unfathomable 10,985. It's extraordinary. Let's, as we do every day, let's think about a few of those we have lost. First up, we remember Anthony and Elizabeth Giorgiani. They were, by the way, better known as Rocky and Betsy. What a great couple. Look at them. And they were married for over 61 years. They were both born and raised in New Brunswick, and they met at St. Mary's Church in New Brunswick after Rocky returned from serving in the United States Army in the Korean War. Theirs was a story of love at first sight. They soon married, and after the birth of their first child, Tony, they moved to North Brunswick. There they would raise their other two children as well, Gina and Andrea, and stay for 37 years. Rocky was a proud member of Carpenter's local 1006 out of Milltown for 45 years, and Betsy worked at First Fidelity Bank. They always loved the Jersey Shore, and after their respective retirements, they moved full-time to their quote-unquote happy place, Lavalette, in Ocean County. Their family was always welcomed down the shore, their children and their spouses, and especially their four granddaughters, Alenia, Avery, Annabella, and Arden. After Hurricane Sandy, however, Betsy and Rocky moved to Lakewood, where they resided for the past six years. Betsy passed on May 9th. Her funeral was on the 15th, and four days later, Rocky passed, and his funeral was yesterday. 
I spoke to their son-in-law, TK, and we had a conversation about both of them and their family and, and talked about their family bonds that were forged through the strong values that Rocky and Betsy instilled in their children and grandchildren, especially their love for the Jersey Shore and their overall appreciation for the preciousness of life. May God bless them both, and it's only fitting that we acknowledge them and pay homage to them as we open up for the summer on the shore. God bless them both. Today, we also remember one of our tremendous first responders, Dave Pinto from Wallington in Bergen County. I heard about Dave from many, including my dear friend Bernadette McPherson, but Dave, uh, I heard about uh, from all different directions. He was born in Jersey City. Dave started his career as a letter carrier, but he found a new avenue of service and since 1994 had been a member of the EMT squad with the New Jersey Sports and Exposition Authority. While there, he was proud to say that he worked at World Cup soccer matches and countless concerts. I know the boss watches us from time to time. 15 of those concerts were Bruce Springsteen shows. Uh, not that anyone counted, by the way. He loved every second of it. He was present for a bunch of Jets and Giants games. I hope they won a few of them. And also worked the morning workouts at the Meadowlands racetrack. Wherever and whenever Dave was needed, he was there. Dave also had served a variety of roles along with the Chief of Wallington Fire Department and was a past member of the Wallington Board of Education and had even been elected by his peers to be its president. He was also an active member of the Wallington Emergency Squad for over 30 years until his passing. Dave leaves behind his high school sweetheart and wife, Barbara, as well as daughter, Nicole, and son, David, and one grandson, and he also leaves countless friends and colleagues I spoke with Barbara, Nicole, and David yesterday, and it was a moving conversation about an incredible guy. Dave was just 70 years old. We thank Dave for his career of service, and we keep him and his family in our thoughts. God bless you, pal, and God rest your soul. Three more among the thousands of lives cut short by COVID-19 across our state. This is our family. We all mourn with those left behind. And this weekend, let's take a moment to say a prayer for them as we remember our fallen military heroes especially. Switching gears, we just got word that my request for an extension of the FEMA testing sites uh, in both Bergen Community College and the PNC Art, Arts uh, Bank Center uh, has been ex accepted and extended till the end of June, which is a big deal. This otherwise was only going to be to the end of May. That's, that's huge, and also there is an acknowledgement uh, that the capacity of testing in each of those sites will also be raised. So that's really, really good news on the testing front. We've got a quick announcement from the Office of the Secretary of Higher Education, Dr. Zakia Smith-Ellis. Our public colleges and universities will be dividing up a total of $68.8 million in federal CARES Act funds to help them cover more of the expenses they have incurred in their efforts to continue providing educational services to their students. Specifically, this funding is coming from the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, which provided us with a flexible emergency block grant. And working with Dr. Smith-Ellis and her team, we are developing a formula to ensure this funding is equitably, alloc equitably allocated among our public institutions of higher education. And it must be noted that this funding comes on top of the nearly $310 million in federal support we are delivering to our elementary and secondary schools to help them weather this emergency. So I am proud that we can now better support our colleges and universities as well. Now, before I turn things over to Liz, I want to close with a note about the weekend before us. It's at this, it, at this point that I usually give a shout out to an individual or community-based group making a real difference in our communities. But today I want to give a much broader collective shout out to all of the women and men who have served our nation in our armed forces in times of war and in times of peace. And through them, to all the New Jerseyans who died while in service to our nation. There will be more muted commemorations at cemeteries across our state. And the graves of our honored dead will be, as they of right should be, decorated with flags. On Monday morning I will join with Adjutant General Brigadier General Jamal Beal and others for a small commemoration at the Brigadier General William C. Doyle Memorial Cemetery in Wrightstown, as I do every year. And another 
Special commemoration will be aboard the battleship New Jersey, where a virtual celebration via Facebook, by the way, will honor the 77th anniversary of its commissioning. There should be absolutely zero irony in the fact that the most decorated naval ve vessel in our nation's history, a battleship dedicated, and I quote, to the preservation of peace in our hemisphere, bears the name of our home state. Like our people, New Jersey, the, the New Jersey is strong and tough, battle-tested and always answered the call of service to defend our nation's values and to promote the cause of peace. So to every honored veteran across our state, we thank you for your service to our nation and for living the highest values of patriotism. And three, through you, we remember your brothers and sisters in arms who are no longer with us. Let us never forget all who gave their full measure on the battlefields, on the seas, and in the air, so that the ideals of our nation could be a beacon of hope for all the world. And so as I close today, may God bless you all. May God bless all who served. And may God continue to bless the great state of New Jersey and the United States of America. With that, please help me welcome the treasurer of this great state, a great leader in her own right, Treasurer Liz Moyle. Thanks, Governor, and thank you for having me here today. Just like everyone at home, all of us at Treasury have appreciated these daily briefings, and uh, we're very grateful for your steady leadership and the hard work of everybody here at the table every day. So thank you all. Um, as we're all aware, COVID-19 has created a public health crisis not seen since the Spanish flu over a century ago. But it's also created a global economic crisis that the world has not seen since the Great Depression. That's what we at Treasury have been dealing with behind the scenes for several months now. New Jersey is not alone. States across the country are facing similar fiscal challenges that seemed inconceivable just a few short months ago. And as we know all too well now, times of serious trial only increase the need for effective governmental services. For Treasury, our primary goal from day one has been to ensure, first and foremost, that the people of New Jersey have the resources and support they need to address this brutal public health crisis. At the same time, however, we have been working nonstop to address the related fiscal crisis that has grown to unprecedented proportions. And I know I don't have to tell New Jerseyans this, but it has not been easy. Our challenges, like yours, and are real, and quite frankly, they're like nothing most of us have ever witnessed before. There isn't going to be one easy solution. We will need a multifaceted approach, and it's going to require some tough decisions. Like many taxpayers, we, as a state, had been living paycheck to paycheck for far too long. Under the governor's leadership, we had really started to make great strides over the last two years to improve our fiscal condition doing it the way most families do, shoring up our savings, paying our bills, and investing wisely. We made record payments into the pension system to decrease our liability. We boosted our savings by increasing our surplus significantly and making our first rainy day fund deposit in a decade. And we were making serious investments in areas that had been starved for resources, public education and New Jersey Transit chief among them and then COVID came along. The global pandemic it has sparked has halted this progress in its tracks. Our economic analysts, like analysts around the country, have been working around the clock ever since to try and gauge the short and long-term impact of this crisis. Based on a wide variety of economic assumptions, we are now potentially in New Jersey facing a shortfall of nearly $10 billion through the end of fiscal year 2021 next June. $10 billion. That is a jaw-dropping figure. And while there are many moving parts, what is clear is that a decline of this magnitude would be worse than the Great Recession. When it comes to the sales tax, for example, which has obviously been impacted by business closures, we are forecasting a 33% decline in collections from May through July over the same period last year. For context, 
the worst sales tax month during the Great Recession in 08-09, saw a decline of 18.4%. What this means is that the sizable surplus and rainy day fund we worked so hard to build together will easily be depleted. I point this out not to be a doomsayer, but to underscore that some extremely difficult decisions will have to be made in the weeks and months ahead, decisions no one wants to make, but they will be unavoidable. Just like it will be for many New Jerseyans, our road ahead is going to require a combination of serious budget tightening, critically needed borrowing, and federal assistance, much more robust federal assistance. The governor has been out there since day one, lobbying for the federal support we unequivocally need. He has been a tremendous ambassador for New Jersey and our needs. One would even think you might have done this for a living before at some point. The, the, budget, the budget report we will be releasing a little later today is designed to serve as a roadmap to help New Jersey begin to navigate what is essentially uncharted territory. It's marked by hard choices some we've already made, and some we are proposing to make. As soon as this crisis began to unfold, we placed roughly $1 billion of appropriations into reserve. We issued a statewide hiring freeze, except for crucial COVID-related needs. And we put more than $500 million in other planned spending for this fiscal year on hold. We are also proposed, proposing to deappropriate approximately $1.32 billion, which was not an easy choice because it included many priorities shared by everyone. And additional balances will be retained in reserve until we see how the current fiscal year pans out. As the governor said, I'll go into greater detail during our virtual press conference later this afternoon. But essentially, it will outline the administration's proposed path through the extended fiscal year, which will now end three months later than normal on September 30th. Our hope is that by then, we'll have a better handle on, the federal, on what federal assistance we can anticipate receiving. And we'll also have a better handle on how our state revenue situation is looking since we extended the tax filing deadline from April 15th to July 15th to help provide some relief for taxpayers. The report we're releasing today also recognizes the significant challenges that lie ahead in the development and passage of the next budget for fiscal year 21. But I have no doubt we'll get through this like we have many times before. Like the governor says, we're certainly not going to be spiking any footballs anytime soon. But as he's also fond of saying, we'll get through this together. At the end of the day, I have no doubt we'll position New Jersey firmly on the road to recovery. Thank you. Liz, thank you for your extraordinary leadership in both peace and at war. Uh, and this is a lot harder than uh, in peacetime, I can say. We, we inherited, you know, it, part of the reason we got here to begin with, a big part of the reason was to restore, not just get the economy growing and make it fair again, but re restore fiscal sanity. And we had made such progress led by you over the past uh, two, now almost two and a half years. And I'll repeat the immortal philosopher again, Mike Tyson, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And God knows we've been punched in the face from both a health perspective uh, and, and now and, and clearly as an economic perspective. And so look at the, the job losses, look at the crushing impact on small businesses, uh, hospital systems, transit, and then add to that uh, states and the, the key challenge for us again that's why we need to be able to borrow that's why we need the fiscal uh, direct fiscal cash assistance from Washington is not to help us with what we got elected to fix we, we, we got a plan for that 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 we're, we're okay with I, I want to we have to keep firefighters police EMS healthcare workers educators in their jobs at, at our greatest hour of need serving our uh, residents who need them more than ever before and at the same time keeping employment as, as robust as humanly possible. That's what we need the help for. So thank you for your leadership and your whole team. With that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction to my right, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Percy Kelly. Thank you, Governor. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> as we prepare for Memorial, the Memorial Day holiday weekend, 
Uh, we expect more residents uh, to be out in our parks, uh, visiting beaches, and having backyard barbecues. Being outdoors and physically active is so important for your mental and physical health, but we want you to enjoy these activities safely. So today I want to reemphasize the importance of taking precautions to protect yourselves and others. We want individuals to wear face coverings and to wear them correctly. Your nose and your mouth should be covered. When possible, clean your hands with soap and water or alcohol-based hand sanitizer immediately before putting on your mask, adjusting it and after removing your mask. Wash the fa your face uh, covering uh, after every use. And remember, face coverings do not replace social distancing. They are protecting you from me. Practice social distancing as you enjoy outdoor activities. Stay at least six feet apart. Bring and frequently use hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Avoid gathering with others outside, outside of your household. Don't visit crowded outdoor spaces where you cannot appropriately distance from others. Don't use the playground or participate in organized sports or congregate with others. And of course, if you feel sick, please stay home. Even if you are outside, do not attend large mass gatherings. Just this week, the CDC released a report that examined the cascading impact of two ill individuals who attended gatherings at their church in March. 35 of 92 attendees at the church acquired COVID-19 and three deaths occurred. Subsequently, through contact tracing, contact with church cases led to 26 additional cases being confirmed, including one death in the community. So from just two individuals spreading the virus, 61 cases of confirmed COVID-19 were found and four deaths resulted. This report emphasizes that large gatherings pose a significant risk for the transmission of the virus. For my daily report uh, last evening, as the governor shared, our hospitals reported 3,017 hospitalizations with 846 individuals in critical care, and 80% of them are on ventilators. Today, I am reporting a total, like yesterday, of 19 cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children there are no new deaths reported. There are, I'm not, I should not say new deaths, there are no deaths reported. And the ages of the children affected are one to 18. 14 of the 19 have tested positive for COVID-19. The governor reviewed the new cases and deaths reported today in terms of deaths. The breakdown of deaths by race and ethnicity, ethnicity is as follows. White, 53.3, black, 18.5, Hispanic 19.4, Asian 5.5, and other 3.4. The state's veteran homes uh, report similar to yesterday, uh, 381 residents testing positive, a total of 143 deaths, no new deaths today. And at our state psychiatric hospitals, again, similar to yesterday with a census of 1,240, 210 patients have tested positive, and there have been a total of 13 patient deaths, uh, no new deaths today. As of May 18th, New Jersey overall uh, percent positivity is 14%, 12% in the north, 13% in the central part of the state, and 24% in the south. So that concludes my daily statistical report. Enjoy your holiday weekend safely. Judy, thank you for that and for everything. Um, I mentioned this in passing positivity rate. I just make two quick comments. Number one, I don't know that this is going to ever be proven, but the, the weekend gives us some distortions would be my, my theory of the case. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, note that the number is higher in the South and that just, that, that is consistent with what we've been saying now for weeks in terms of the migration. And if you look at the hospitalizations today by region, you get another, another read on that. So thank you for 
all of the above. Um, please help me welcome the superintendent of the state police uh, with updates on compliance and other matters. Another great leader, Pat Callahan. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, everybody. With regards to the compliance issues overnight in Teaneck, a car wash owner was cited for uh, for having open and operating the car wash in Hillsboro. Gym owner was cited for EO violation for being open in Hoboken. A pizzeria owner was cited for having both indoor and outdoor dining underway. Uh, refused uh, to close when warned. Uh, in Clifton. A hair salon and nail spa owner was uh, charged with an EO violation. In Rawway, a large crowd had gathered and failed to disperse. One subject at that gathering was cited for an EO violation. And in Gloucester Township, police responded to a dispute between a father and son. The father was subsequently placed under arrest, charged with resisting, uh, and during, re re during the arrest, kicked officers and coughed on them, claiming they had COVID-19. Uh, and just real quickly, Governor, if I may, uh, one, because she's here, um, the state treasurer, your team at OMB, at Purchase and Property, at uh, Division of Property Management and Construction, we could not have built out those hospitals and those sites. We could not have gotten PPE and ventilators without that collective effort from, from all entities in Treasury. And it, I just... Uh, certainly just wanted to, since you're sitting to my right, thank you for that. Uh, in addition to our county OEM coordinators who just continue to go above and beyond with things that we we're asking them to do that none of us have ever had ever thought we'd need to plan for from PPE to test sites to uh, assessing what mitigation efforts we're going to put in place for, uh, God forbid, this comes back in the fall. So I just wanted to uh, thank both Liz and the county OEM coordinators. Amen to that. And, and Liz, is, uh, Pat, thank you for your leadership. I'll come back to compliance in a second. But when Liz and I first met, Liz was a senior executive in Mercer County, in her home county, which it continues to be, was the head of the political party here, uh, one of the parties, and, and then uh, became a member of the assembly uh, and now treasurer. And, and I, I, it's just an extraordinary professional and personal life story. Uh, and I want to echo Pat's thanks, Liz, to you and your team uh, at this hour of great need. Compliance, again, overwhelmingly, uh, people are doing the right things. Um, again, to repeat what I said earlier, we're not opening up dining, either outdoors or indoors. So, so please don't mistake uh, what I've said about increasing the allowed gatherings to 25 uh, persons. Uh, I hope to get to outdoor dining sooner than later, but we're not there yet. And secondly, uh, we continue to uh, say that the hope for those who want to have some sort of an outdoor, so properly socially distant uh, graduation ceremony, your hope is well placed. And I hope that we can have some guidance for you uh, early midweek. Uh, this is, we want to get this right, obviously, because this would be a big gathering and it has to be done right. And I echo what Judy said, this super spreader notion and Christina may comment on this at some point as well, uh, a big piece yesterday in one of the national newspapers that not only are the big gatherings indoors in particular and in pr close proximity challenging, but that the impact that the virus has on individuals from those gatherings is much more uh, consequential, much more difficult than uh, just getting it in a, in a sort of passing way. So. Uh, please, folks, uh, we're, we're not doing this for any reason other than to keep as many people healthy and alive as possible. So again, Pat, thank you for that report. Let's start over here if we could, and we're going to go quickly just because uh, we got a lot of folks who want to get, uh, get away here. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Governor, two quick questions. Um, could you explain what a furlough decision would mean for the state workers? What does that involve them to do? And the other question is, and I know you're tired of hearing about this, but the gym owners in Belmar, obviously they were closed yesterday, Judy, because, you know, you, you signed the order to close them down, but they reopened again this morning. So where do you go from here with those, those people that continue to defy the order? Yeah, I mean, I, I, on the gym owners, I would just, uh, I'm not going to comment about the specific uh, of it, and you'll forgive me for that because I'm sure there's going to be uh, all sorts of uh, noise around that, including legal, uh, at least that's what they've said. Um, let me say two things, though, unequivocally. Overwhelmingly, gym operators are doing the right thing. In fact, they've been even the ones who want to open. A lot of them have been coming to us with what we think are very responsible plans to say, listen, how do you guys 
feel about this. And so I want to say that overwhelmingly there's compliance. And secondly, we're not there yet. I mean, it, this, this is a, what, what good does it do us to say that we're not opening gyms unless we've got a good reason? And we just heard from, from Judy, if you're indoors, you don't have ventilation, you're in close proximity, you're, you're, you're sedentary and or you're sweating and spitting and breathing heavily, it's a Petri dish. And so it's not just for, there's no, there's no reason otherwise that we wouldn't want to do this. We don't want to, I want people to go out, Judy wants them to go out and get the mental health that they deserve, the physical health they deserve. Um, on furloughs, Matt, would you mind commenting on furloughs? And then if, if Liz wants to add anything, although I think it was more of, of, a, of in your lane, Matt, please. Sure. So yesterday, the Civil Service Commission uh, relaxed some rules or regulations that would allow for a voluntary furlough in lieu of layoff um, uh, up to 90 days, as well as to continue the employer contribution on health benefits. These furlough, the state has not furloughed any workers um, to date, uh, obviously, given the revenue numbers that the treasurer has spoken about, I would say, you know, we're actively in conversations and all options, you know, are on the table. There are a number of local units that have uh, sought or have collectively bargained for low agreements are working with labor and they needed the flexibility and the rules that uh, the Civil Service Commission has granted uh, as of yesterday. Liz will go through the budget later on, as I mentioned today, and it's pretty dire stuff. So you may want to look at that and, and come back to us after that. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Elise, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, for the state treasurer, you mentioned uh, $1.32 billion. Um, could you give some detail on that figure, where it applies, um, and how that, how that breaks down exactly? The only thing I would say, Liz, at least, uh, Liz, you, you may want to give a couple of broad strokes, but this is an example of something we're going to get into in chapter and verse at 130. Is that fair to say? Yes, and, and the report will specify by line item where the deappropriations will, will occur. I'll just say for purposes of this discussion that the majority of them will be on the reserve list, are currently on the billion dollars in reserve list that uh, OMB has uh, 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 yeah, Office of Management and Budget has updated regularly on their website. So this would be the list that you've seen from probably two months ago at this point, Liz, and then it's now a little bit on steroids. That was about just under a billion. This is just over a billion three. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Good, good, uh, still good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hi, uh, I have a couple questions for my colleagues at The Record and, and, and the Asbury Park Press. Um, for the Treasurer, when you announced your latest revenue projections on May 13th, the predictions were, uh, quote, based on the assumption that there were not, there will not be a resurgence of COVID-19 cases later. Um, since health officials and, and models are projecting there will be a second, or there, well, there will be a second surge, um, why do you not include those assumptions in the in when predicting the revenue losses, and wouldn't that kind of make the predictions a little bit more rosier than reality? Um, for the governor, in the light of the financial crisis that the state faces, can you say how likely it will be for New Jersey to provide some sort of financial assistance for undocumented immigrants who file state income taxes, which is something immigration advocates and, and Democratic lawmakers are pushing for? Um, Turning to the, the shore towns, uh, many of the shore towns are concerned they're not going to have enough special officers for the summer season. Um, for example, that was why Point Pleasant Beach says they cannot open Jenkinson's boardwalk um, because they don't have enough officers to patrol. Is there any update you have on um, reopening the police academies? Um, and for a lot of the shore businesses, this is, a summer, is a, an essential season for them. Um, what kind of timing are you looking at for reopening arcades, rides, and the boardwalk shops? Okay. And then one last one. Um, one last one quickly. Are you planning to visit the boardwalk or the beaches this, this weekend? Well, that's a good one. You, you ended on a nice note. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things and then maybe Liz and Pat uh, may want to weigh in. Um, Liz will say this, it does not envision a resurgence. And I think Liz would say, I don't want to put words in your mouth. If we do get a resurgence, you're plus, you and your team are plus or minus. It's another billion dollars. Uh, and I would not use the word rosy in any event to describe what you'll hear about later on uh, today. Open-minded to providing financial assistance to undocumented, but again, we're in a very resource-constrained world. Um, we, we had a meeting, as I promised yesterday, Director Maples, Colonel Callahan, the Attorney General, Matt, George Helmley, myself, Jen Davenport, number two at 
um, in, in, uh, in the Justice Department talking about uh, preparedness for Memorial Day weekend. And this topic not just came up yesterday, but it's come up whether or not the shore towns have enough folks to be able to put at the point of attack. I know Point Pleasant is one example of a town that has said they're not sure they've got the resources they need. I'll let Pat and or Jared weigh in. Nothing new to report on arcades or shops. Um, you know, if, if this will depend on if we continue to have a, a, another couple of good weeks here. My hope is that we get to that, particularly if they're outdoors. Uh, and lastly, yes, I will be somewhere uh, weather dependent on the boardwalk, probably doing a run and, and, and strolling a little bit with my wife somewhere in the Seaside Heights, Seaside Park uh, neighborhood sometime this weekend. I'm not sure. I, I don't have an exact moment as to when. Um, Liz, anything else you want to add on, the, uh, on resurgence? No, other than uh, our Office of Revenue and Econ Economic Analysis has uh, taken a look at sort of modeling out what, would, what we would expect if there was a fall resurgence. And as the governor mentioned, it's roughly another additional billion, $1 billion hit to our revenues. Um, that will appear as uh, in the report that will be issued this afternoon. It's very difficult, though, to budget based on sort of supposing that there is a resurgence. Um, you know, modeling this for this revenue forecast is difficult in the best of circumstances with because we just really have no precedent for this. But um, if we, we are letting the legislature know that in the event that happens, we could expect a, a you know, a worse outcome to the tune of about a billion dollars. We have not um, modeled yet what, you know, some uh, epidemiologists are predicting sort of a, a flow, you know, an ebb and flow of the, the virus. That is something we have not uh, modeled out yet, but that is something else to take into consideration. And on the other side of the coin, we haven't modeled in either a, a valid therapeutic or a vaccine either, which would swing us to a different more positive place. Um, Pat, any quick comment on, on shore, um, particularly summer surge uh, staffing and any advice you've got for folks out there in terms of trying to figure out whether that's safe to get back and uh, get, get on the beach? Sure, Gov. The, the Attorney General and I were, were actually on a call this morning with 800 law enforcement officers, a lot of chiefs from around the state. The shore was a topic of discussion. Uh, we're working with the Police Training Commission on making sure we have enough special officers. Uh, that's starting to shake loose right now in addition to our own state police class. So we think we'll be uh, well positioned with staff throughout the summer to, uh, to support the, the shore towns. Again, mother, mother Nature is not, as I said yesterday, I, I'm, I'm normally overwhelmingly, and I, I hope it's 85, sunny and low humidity. Uh, it's going to be none of that this weekend. Uh, and so I, I, I'm not happy to say that by any means. I'd prefer it to be otherwise. But in this extraordinary moment, it probably gives us, almost certainly gives us, an opportunity to creep into the summer a little bit more gradually than it otherwise would have. Do you have anything, sir? No, I don't. I'm you good? Okay. Give us one sec. Matt, how are you? Don't pull a hamstring coming across the room there. Okay, Morning, Governor. thank you. I have a few from my colleagues at NJ Spotlight and NJTV. Um, have you gotten updated outbreak plans at this point from all the long-term care facilities? And can you update us on how many staff and residents have been tested so far? And we're told that uh, Bergen County mayors have been asking for state oversight as early as March. Uh, was the state slow to respond here? Uh, what... Um, Separate topic, what are the percentages of testing uh, for COVID in various group settings, long-term care, uh, psychiatric developmental centers and prisons, and how does that compare to the general population? And uh, how many correction staff have died as, um, from COVID, and why is the state not reporting this number uh, while well, you're reporting uh, deaths among staff at developmental centers, psychiatric hospitals, nursing homes, et cetera? Um, and then on one more on Last taxes. one, please. Um, very simply on the budget, uh, should residents prepare for tax increases? Okay, on the last one, uh, there's, there's nothing that Liz will talk about today that includes uh, tax increases in the stub budget period, unless there was something I missed. Uh, that's obviously not, we're commenting about between today and September 30, beyond that is, is not. Um, I'll let Judy come back with us. We've given you in chapter and verse uh, the approach to long-term care facilities. So with all due respect to the question about folks were asking, everyone was asking. This was World War III, uh, and, and, and uh, we've gone through, I think, 
a very um, uh, comprehensive, particularly yesterday, set of steps that we took right from the get-go. Uh, I think Judy's first directive was on March 6th. Um, and again, there are operators, uh, remember the, the, a big part of this reality are operators who operate some number of these over many hundreds of uh, different locations. So update, Judy, we've got update on the outbreak. That was in long-term care. I, I, I missed the first question. In, uh, in various, I'll check real quick, sorry. It was uh, long-term care, psychiatric hospitals, developmental centers, uh, developmental centers and prisons, and just how that compares to the general population. Okay. Judy? Yeah, I don't have comparisons to the general population. The, the out, you want outbreaks in psychiatric and, I mean, I, I, if, if you... I mean, we show the yeah. positives every day. We yeah. show the fatalities every day from long-term care facilities. What more did you want? Um, I would just say this, Judy, tell me if you disagree with this. First of all, we show the number of positives every day. Right. I don't know that we have the positivity rate for long-term care. We have it for the state. We show the number of fatalities. We also showed, again, the other day, the, the hierarchy of where the, um, the testing, the order of the testing, uh, and the vulnerable communities, including long-term care, are in the, the most important category, first category. So if you looked at total testing per capita, it's going to be higher in a long-term care facility than it is in the general public because you go from long-term vulnerable populations, frontline workers, especially healthcare first responders, and then the general population. So per capita, you're going to have more testing up top, secondly here, thirdly here. I don't have the numbers, though, unless you do. Yeah, I have the positivity rate in long-term care with uh, 35,215 tests uh, is 8%. Um, and the retest uh, of 4,179 um, individuals who originally tested negative were retested within th three to seven days, and that uh, percent positivity was 10%. So lower than the, what we're reporting in the general population at this point. Please, God, it stays that way. Yeah. And then can we get back? You asked about correction staff fatalities, uh, unless you have yeah, that. I can don't we have that. With we'll me. come back to you on that. Is that all right? Okay, thank you. Chai, good, good, good morning still. Yes, good morning, Governor. Um, some recall committees were formed here in Trenton. Uh, would you sign an executive order allowing for the electronic collection of signatures for their recall petitions, or will they have to collect those signatures in person? I um, want to thank the health commissioner for her help in getting Robert Wood Johnson to release their EO111 data. Um, and respectfully, why are you allowing these healthcare facilities to decide whether or not to release that data? Shouldn't the public have access to that information uh, regardless? And um, finally, there's a situation in New Brunswick. Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas is planning to purchase, close, and demolish the Lincoln Annex Public School in New Brunswick to expand the Rutgers Cancer Institute. It's a school that was a private school for many years. I believe it's the alma mater of the health commissioner. Uh, but uh, local taxpayers paid $22 million to upgrade and reopen it as a public school just four years ago. Commissioner, how do you feel about Robert Wood Johnson's plan to destroy that school building? Will you intervene to save the school or at least ensure a replacement school gets built before any closure? And Governor, how do you feel about the school district in New Brunswick attempting to move forward with the plans to sell the school during the pandemic? Is this the right time for districts to be taking such drastic As a action? graduate of the school, Judy has a conflict of interest here. Um, I'll let Judy speak for herself. I've got no nothing. Uh, to, first time I've been asked about the electronic uh, petitions on the recall in Trenton. I've got no good answer for you. I'll, we'll come back to you on that. Uh, the, the second point was an homage to Judy on RWJ uh, uh, Barnabas releasing information under Executive Order 111. I'll let Matt Plankin, Plankin handle uh, why they are um, the health your question about why could why should healthcare facilities themselves make the decision on complying and I've got no uh, opinion uh, other than I'm a, we have the number one public education system in America and I want it to stay that way and that cancer uh, research center is going to be a game changer uh, in, for a lot of things including jobs as well as for education beyond that I've got no comment on that anything on the EO uh, data or disclosures rather Da we present data every day pursuant to EO 111. Uh, beyond that, we'd have to take a look at a particular request. Yeah, we'll come back to the specifics of a, a request. Anything on your alma mater? I have fond memories, but um, the bricks and mortar are not them. 
God bless you. Thank you. Let's go up back and then we'll come back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's actually still... Or, yep, we're still... Still, still there. 11.55 <laughs> appears to me. Uh, for municipalities in the Pinelands, uh, will their pilot funding for their preserved open land remain restored as a result of this fiscal crisis? Um, why are you holding off on opening outdoor dining? What didn't you see? Um, for you know towns that have a surplus, are you recommending that they expend that surplus in its entirety before furloughing or laying off uh, personnel? And uh, my fourth question is in regards to the significant sales tax loss. How much of the overall revenue pie is that? You said that I think 33% was the decline, but how much is the overall loss in revenue? Okay, so um, a municipals, uh, municipalities in the Pinelands, and whether or not the pilot money is impacted by the budget, I'm going to defer to Liz's briefing later on, if that's okay with you. Um, we're holding off on outdoor dining because of the fact that it is, while it's outdoors, you're in close proximity and you're sedentary by definition, right? You're sitting, having dinner. We want to make sure we get that right. I hope we're sooner than later on that, but we're not there yet. Um, surplus in towns, should they spend them before they furlough? That's a decision that is going to be subject to the very specifics of a given town. I mean, surpluses we hold dear at the state level, and I think any municipality that has one likely also holds it dear, but at the same time, you know, if, if they're, they're faced with some really tough decisions here in terms of doing that versus laying people off furlough or otherwise, it's yet another reason why we need to borrow, we need federal cash assistance, and that goes right to addressing that particular point. Liz, $2.7 billion hit on, on revenues between now and June 30th. By the way, none of this is about expenses, right? We're still talking about revenues. Expenses battling COVID are, are going up by the day and, and, and as a result, but let's stay on revenues. 2.7 billion between now and June, uh, September 30, pardon me, and then another 7.2 billion between uh, October 1 and next June 30. How much of that in each of those cases dollar-wise is sales tax? Do you have that? Yeah, is that the total? The, that's when you asked for the overall figure. You were talking about just sales tax overall decline. Yep, the sales tax for FY20 is predicted to decline um, by 1.131 billion less than the GBM forecast in February. Governor's bu budget message, Sorry, right? That yep. was as of late February? Right, February 25th. Um, so that's a 10.9% decline for fiscal year 2020. And then for fiscal year 2021, uh, revenues for sales tax are expected to be $1.528 billion or 14.2% lower than the governor's budget message in February. So can I tack on to that, if I may? Um, so you'd add 1.13 to 1.5, you get 2.6 and change, and that's out of a total of 10, about 9.9 .9 billion. Thank you. Brent. Does uh, yesterday's announcement on furloughs come in lieu of Steve Sweeney's furlough plan? Do you plan to veto that now? People who buy cars from private individuals can't register online and uh, need to drive to get to work. What alternatives are you thinking of? Can the state have licensed driving instructors give road tests to new drivers, report the results to the state, and remotely issue a temporary license to reduce the backlog? The CDC said there's evidence the virus may not spread as much as once thought on surfaces. Does that mean things like playgrounds might reopen soon? And with beaches uh, opening, what is the guidance from people from separate families who want to share a house? Are they not allowed to, you know? Um, I'm gonna ask Matt to address a number of these, but Judy and Tina, before I do, I read the same guidance Brent is asking about that they're reassessing how long this virus lives on a surface. I would think that to Brent's question that, again, if it's an outdoor surface, that's something we're likely going to get to sooner than, than we would to an indoor surface. But any, any reaction to that guidance? 
Yeah, right now the evidence suggests that um, surfaces, contaminated surfaces, aren't really the main mode of transmission. However, it doesn't mean that you still shouldn't be cleaning the surfaces, shouldn't be disinfecting the surfaces as well. So all those other um, uh, uh, infection control measures still need to be implemented, even if the, uh, the mechanism of transmission might not be as, uh, as viable. I got a lot of grief for using the phrase bubbles a few days ago, but that's a commonly now increasingly commonly used phrase where you're cohabitating with family overwhelmingly most likely and or some folks you've just been in, this, in a similar eco uh, uh, system with over a period of time. And there's, the, there's a challenge. I'm not a health expert as you likely know by now, but when you start crossing these bubbles with each other, you obviously, it's a step where you take uh, more risk. Um, and so I would just say, go into that with your eyes open. This is your last question. And, and even if you're under the same roof, if, you're, if you've not been with that other person or you've got d different groups, uh, adhere to the limits of congregation that we're raising as of today. But I would keep your distance. That's a personal opinion. I would not be sitting side by side tightly indoors with someone you have not been hanging around with yet. Any, do you dis disagree or you good with that? Okay. There's no strict other than the total uh, um, numbers. Matt, you got furloughs um, in, in the Senate president's bill, private car sales. And I didn't, I'm not sure I understood your uh, driver's uh, road test. Hold on, hold on. It, it's because people can't go to DMVs to get uh, their driver's license. I guess this goes back to teenagers driving. This is from a colleague, so I'm not quite yeah. sure. Can the state have licensed driving instructors give road tests to new drivers, report the results back to the state, and remotely issue a temporary? I, I understand the question now. The answer is no. The, the other two were private car sales and um, furloughs. Yeah, on, on private car sales, we'll have, uh, have to have MVC get back to you, Brent. Um, on furloughs, I think I said earlier uh, you know, what yesterday's actions meant um, and you know, I'll defer comment on the Senate President's bill until uh, the governor's ready to take action. Just on the shared houses, as long as it's not their primary residence, as in you know, people aren't all living together on a permanent basis, uh, there's the 10 person limit indoors still applies. Obviously towns themselves uh, still have the authority to make determinations as to whether they want to allow short term rentals um, and some have and some have not. I made an, an yet another mistake. It, by the way, it is now officially afternoon, but secondly, the indoor restriction remains at 10, and I, I should have said that. What we lifted today is outdoors. Like two people from different yeah, but I think that you've got to be smart. You've got to use common sense. I think this is going to be a, a challenge for everybody as we further open. How do you responsibly, and by the way, let's remember, we've said this from the get-go, most importantly, the most vulnerable among us, seniors, comorbidities, um, intensely congregated persons, communities that are um, most vulnerable, communities of color, quite clearly. I mean, there's going to be certain uh, density uh, is something we've got to be careful. and We've got to be careful cross-generational. It's one of the biggest challenges you all have asked about education and what's, what's our game plan look like. It's a, one of the toughest nuts to crack between Judy and the Department of Education and their teams as to what does that look like. Daniel, you get to close this out. Hi, Governor. Uh, these are all budget questions. Um, when you say that, that well, the taxing, there might not be any tax increases uh, through September 30th, but that beyond that could be different. Are you, are you saying there might be increases in FY21? Um, the 10 billion is certainly a, a sizable chunk, but it seems quite different from the 30 billion that you had mentioned in the past. Um, why the discrepancy? Um, do you expect the drop in the gas tax can mean the rate will have to increase this summer? So that about the gas tax, sorry? Do you expect that the drop in the gas tax, uh, gas consumption would mean the rate would go up this summer? And um, do you expect the state's credit rating could go down if, the state's because what? that the state's credit rating could go down, could, yeah, sorry, could go down because of the, uh, the borrowing for the Federal Reserve? So I'll give you some quick thoughts and then uh, Liz can come in behind me. Um, we're not here today, and Liz is briefing through September 30th, other than projecting revenue loss for the period between October 1 and June 30. I'm not opining one way or the other on 
what, what our solutions are going to be, uh, other than we need federal cash and we need to be able to borrow. Uh, today, we're here to talk about between now, in, in terms of a full budget, uh, I mean, between now and September 30th, and then at some point down the road, we'll talk about October 1 to June 30th. $10 billion in revenue. I said this a minute ago in passing, but I'll lay on this. $10 billion in revenue changes. That does not include a dramatic amount of expenditure, PPE, medications, ventilators, uh, beds. Uh, dealing with this crisis is, is a whole lot more beyond the $10 billion shift in revenues. And by the way, that's only through June 30th of next year. I'm, I'm good. I'm, st I'm still going to answer you here. Thank you. Uh, Liz makes the decision on gas tax in August. Last I checked, it's May. We'll come back to you in August on that one. And we've been in touch with the rating agencies. Liz and her team uh, have an outstanding relationships with them. And it's too early to tell. But we want to make sure, for instance, before we go live today with what we're going live with in terms of a proposed stub period budget, uh, that again, Liz will give you in more detail at 1.30. We, we absolutely, as a courtesy, give them a heads up, uh, at least in the general parameters of what that will look like. And we'll have follow-up discussions with them. I can't speak for them, uh, but I will say this. Uh, decades from now, if we borrow money, and please God, we need to, and we look back on whether or not this was a good time to borrow money in terms of interest rates, and was, was the, were the use of proceeds prudent, uh, the answer will be a resounding yes to both. Liz, do you want to add anything to that? No, just to reiter reiterate what the governor said. I mean, we are in regular contact with the rating agencies. Um, the governor actually, since coming to offices, office has met with them every year, at least a couple times to go over proposed and finalized budget uh, decisions. And, um, so, you know, we, we'll see how the budget plays out and, and uh, you know, we'll learn through the year what their reactions are. The, um, I mean, we were pleased to note that in the opinions that have come out, the issuances from the credit rating agencies since the crisis has begun, um, have noted the fiscally responsible actions taken by the administration since coming in in January. So, you know, that that is good news for us. Um, but clearly we are facing, as I said, unprecedented uh, fiscal uh, a fiscal crisis right now. So um, we're going to work through it um, and we'll continue our relationship with the credit rating agencies on motor fuels. We are seeing declines and we'll get more into detail on that this afternoon. Um, but as the governor said, we'll work with the uh, Office of uh, Legislative Services in August to look at the numbers. It's formulaic. So, um, you know, that will determine whether we uh, have to raise or decrease the gas tax uh, effective October. Yeah, it's important to remind everybody that uh, this isn't Liz uh, having a, uh, on her back porch, uh, trying to put her finger in the air to decide what the gas tax should be. This is a formula that was put in place before we got to office. And so the only stipulation is that every August, the treasurer has to make with the input of the Office of Legislative Services, has to make a conclusion. Um, with that, I'm going to start to mask up, and I want to, I'm honored to wear on my mask today, and not by coincidence, our flag. Um, a couple of housekeeping matters. Number one, again, in the near term, the here and now, Liz is on at 1.30 today for a, a detailed press briefing. Um, we are going to give you all in the media a couple of days off here. Uh, we will be communicating electronically over the entire weekend, uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Uh, we reserve the right, uh, Dan Bryan is with us today, uh, we'll reserve the right to get on the phone with you or, I, God forbid, get in person with you if there's a meaningful development and reason to do so. Otherwise, we will be back physically with you all Tuesday at 11 a.m. And it's 11 a.m. because we've got a White House call, I think, at 1 p.m. on Tuesday. Uh, so we will we'll be back uh, live with you uh, on Tuesday. And again, if we, if we think there's a reason to do so beforehand, we'll get a hold of you ASAP. And the exception to this, of course, is Liz's more detailed discussion of the budget uh, today at 1.30. I just said to Judy, it, 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 we'll be on. By the way, we're not taking the weekend off. Uh, uh, we, we will be fighting this uh, morning, noon, and night, uh, I promise you. Uh, and we'll be paying close attention clearly to the shore and our, our lakes. And by the way, let's give a shout out to our lake communities. This is 
overwhelmingly about the shore and our beaches, but it's also importantly about our lakes. Um, I want to thank Judy uh, for her extraordinary leadership. Christina, thank you as well for your leadership and for each of you. Liz, thank you again. Incorporate my prior uh, comments by reference. Pat, Jared, Matt, Dan, the whole team. Again, to most importantly to everybody out there, uh, two very simple comments. Thank you for everything you've done and please keep doing it. And I think a word that is, keeps coming up is let's all behave responsibly to each other and as it relates to our own public health. So that as we begin to open up, as we begin to wrestle with the questions about crossing in with other people we haven't seen in a while, uh, which will inevitably happen, that we do that responsibly. And secondly, let's remember what Memorial Day is about. And it's about our veterans. It's about the members of our armed services. It's especially about those who have lost their lives uh, defending our nation and standing up for our values. And there's no values anywhere in the history of man that comes close to the American values. And no state has stood, stood taller in defending those values at every step of the way from the revolution right up until today than New Jersey. God bless you all. Take care.